Um, we are in the 10th week now of our Seek First series, uh, this theme at the Father's House in 2024, where we are studying out this theme by looking through the teachings of Jesus, uh, as known as the Sermon on the Mount, in the book of Matthew. And our key text, as you know, you've heard us say this every week, but I'll say it again, Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will give you everything that you need. And for nine weeks, we have looked at what it means to live this seek first kind of life and embrace the difficult teachings of Jesus through uh, the Sermon on the Mount and allow them to reframe the way we think and retrain the way we live. And normally this is the part of the sermon where we would recap some of those things, but I wanna do what I did last week if I could once again and take a moment to just celebrate what I see God doing in our community right now. I think sovereignly by his spirit, but I think also through uh, the content of, of of this Sermon on the Mount. Um, I mentioned last weekend that when you get into the difficult teachings of Jesus, especially the stuff we've been talking about, like divorce and anger and revenge and uh, how to treat your enemies and you know, making uh, no t treaties with sin and a zero tolerance for it in your life, all that fun stuff, uh, that it traditionally causes people to kind of wince a little bit and walk away. In fact, that was what happened with Jesus as we looked at last weekend. Many people walked away when he began to share the, the difficult teachings. And if I'm being honest, I, I know I'm supposed to be a pastor and a man full of faith. But if I'm being honest, I honestly thought that that was what we were going to see a little bit of in our church as we got into the last months of teachings. I thought maybe people would just take a vacation from church for a bit and then come back when, you know, the content was a little bit friendlier. Um, but I am happy to report that we are seeing exactly the opposite in our church right now. Uh, <laughs> Not only, I mean, it's hard to tell at this service on Daylight Savings, but uh, the church is growing like crazy right now. Uh, we're stuffed at the 11 o'clock service, and um, when we were seeing so many new families, last week we had 21 new families come to church for the first time. Um, but every single week, I just feel like people are leaning in a little bit more. There seems to be this hunger in our community, this thing that God is developing where there's a group of people that have said, I'm not here for the feel-good sermons. I'm not here for a watered-down version of the gospel. I'm not here for, you know, some coffee on a porch and a couple of donuts. I'm here because I want to be like Jesus. I'm here because I want the truth. And if it means that I got to embrace some of his difficult teachings along the way, then so be it, because I want to become a kingdom person, not a person of this world. And I love that. I love what God is doing in our community right now. Robin mentioned this, but as evidence of that truth, uh, last weekend, specifically at the 11 o'clock service, we saw the largest response that we've ever seen in the history of the Father's house in five and a half years. As the call went out to <laughs> take up your cross, die to yourself, follow Jesus, great fun stuff, literally 30 to 40 people lifted their hand in the room and said, I want to come to Jesus. And as she mentioned, 10 of them signed up to get baptized. Come on, let's celebrate what God is doing in the house right now. That's a big deal. I love it, man. I'm here for all of it. So I guess I'm done giving disclaimers and being bashful about the nature of the content. I'm going to just read what Jesus said and trust that the Holy Spirit will do the work. All right. Sound good? So with that, let's get into uh, today's content. We got a lot of scriptures we need to get through. Uh, we've made it out of chapter five. We're into chapter six now. Matthew chapter six, verse one. Jesus goes on in the sermon to say this. Be careful not to practice your good deeds in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to someone in need, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to someone in need, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing on the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, girl, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
Um, obviously, as you can tell by the inflection of my voice and the bolded and underlined sections of this scripture, there's a phrase I would like to hone in on today in this portion of our text. Uh, a phrase that Jesus repeats three times in these nine verses that I believe he uses as both a promise and a warning to all of us. And the phrase is this, your father sees everything that is done in secret. So to that end, and in light of that statement, I want to title this chat this morning very simply, The God Who Sees. The God Who Sees. Let's, uh, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you are doing in your house. Um, thank you that we get to be a part of something that is historic in this city. And God, we're not just here playing church week after week. We're seeing lives transformed and destinies shaped and eternities rewritten. And God, it is an honor to be a part of your kingdom and to participate in what you're doing in the earth. Uh, today, as we go to these words that you shared on a hillside many years ago, Jesus, we pray that they would be uh, alive and active, as Hebrews says, that they would cut to the heart of where we're living and that they would be used to transform our minds and transform our lives. We give you permission to speak to us today. In the name of Jesus and the church said, Amen. 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 Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Robin and I went to bed uh, pretty early on a Saturday night, which is our normal custom. Uh, we're senior citizens in that regard. We go to bed pretty early on Saturday nights uh, because we don't get much sleep. Uh, uh, naturally, we kind of think about everything that's going to be happening on Sunday. So we know if we're not in bed early, we're not going to get a very good night's sleep. But um, a few months ago, we got probably the worst night's sleep that we'd ever gotten since starting the church five and a half years ago. Uh, at about 1.30 in the morning, I was awakened by some flashlights in my back window by my head in our bedroom. Um, our bedroom backs up to the backyard, and uh, so when I saw these lights coming through the window, I kind of looked through the blinds, and there standing about 10 feet away from my head was a guy with his hands in the air and a couple of police officers at our back gate with their flashlights getting ready to arrest this individual. So uh, naturally, I jumped out of bed. I was pajamas and all, and I, I ran into the backyard and I began to ask the officers what was happening and they explained to me that this guy was seen on my neighbor's ring cam and she had called and, and reported it to the local precinct and so for the last hour and a half they'd been searching the neighborhood to find this individual and, and to find out what he was doing. Uh, and so after they told me what was happening, they asked me to look around the backyard to see if there was anything out of place or anything had been broken or stolen. And so my office is back there. I was looking at the office. Okay, didn't break in and everything seemed to be in order. But the only thing that, that looked out of place was my hose. It had been unraveled and there was water all over the ground. And uh, later they told me that the reason it was unraveled is because the guy used it to shower in our backyard in the middle of the night. Seems logical for sure. Uh, and so uh, after I confirmed that everything else was intact, they uh, politely told me, okay, sir, you can go back inside and, and you can get some sleep, <laughs> which we all know is impossible to do when you are jarred awake at 1.30 in the morning by police officers in your backyard. Your adrenaline is surging and every sound I heard for the next few hours had me looking out the window to see if somebody was showering yet again in my, in my backyard. And, and so Robin and I got some really broken sleep and uh, kind of peeled ourselves out of bed at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, sucked back the coffee, had an amazing Sunday with all y'all. Uh, but then the next day on Monday, we quickly sat down and began to make a list of all of the things we needed to do in order to ensure that this never happened again. How are we going to make sure our house was safe? So I'm, I'm not the handiest of guys, admittedly, but um, I, I can watch YouTube like the rest of us. And so I, uh, I rebuilt our back fence. There were some short fence boards there that you could look over and not a lot of privacy. So I built a taller fence. Uh, and then I rebuilt a gate in our backyard with a coated latch so that unless you had the code, you couldn't get into our backyard. Um, I added a state-of-the-art alarm system to the uh, metal gate in our side yard in case anybody tried to get in through the side. Uh, by state-of-the-art, I mean a carabiner with um, a couple of jingle bells. I got this at Cabela's in the redneck section, you know, it's great. Uh, <laughs> but I put that on the side yard. Uh, and then uh, probably the best upgrade I made to the house was one of these. I just realized it's not turned off, and so you are all being filmed right now. There you go, okay. Hi. Now we're going to know who is at church today. All right. Uh, this is an Arlo cam. It is a uh, motion-activated camera that I put in 
our backyard so that anytime something moves back there or someone moves back there, both Robin and I are immediately alerted on our phones with a push notification that we can click and we can see what's going on. Uh, except for right now, I guess, because it's at church. So if you wanted to break into my house, now's a great time, all right? <laughs> I don't have much, but what I have, I offer unto you. Um, but I love this thing. N- not only does it make me feel very safe at nighttime when we go to bed, but um, it-, it has provided hours of endless entertainment for me. Uh, not only does it have a video camera, it also has a speaker, a very small one in there. So apparently you can talk to the people that are breaking into your home. <laughs> you know? Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> you should stop right now. Uh, but I get to use it as a bit of an intercom system at our house. It's great. Anytime I see the girls back there, Robin back there, I love to get on my phone and start talking to them. In fact, just Friday, uh, I was on my way to get a haircut and Robin was in the backyard reading and working. And uh, so I got on the Arlo uh, speaker and I started to hit on her from the car. Like, hey girl, what are you doing? <laughs> She looks at the camera, rolls her eyes, and she's like, shut up, I'm trying to work right now. So it it didn't work as well as I thought it would work. Uh, Perhaps it's because I sounded like a pilot trying to hit on a passenger from the plane intercom system because the speaker is very cheap in here, right? So it's like, you know, so I don't know. But I I love this thing. It's it's enabled me to, to see everything that happens in my yard. Nothing happens off of my watch whether it's something uh, innocent like hanging laundry or productive like doing work or sinister like someone breaking into the backyard, nothing happens apart from Arlo's watch. It sees it all. And, And Jesus seems to suggest here in our text that our lives are a lot like my yard. We are all living in the middle backyard, if you will. That's an illustration, not an invitation, just to be clear. But according to this text, you have a father that is watching every detail of your life. He sees everything, not just the things that happen in the light of day, but even, according to Jesus, the things that happen in secret. And there are three that Jesus speaks to here in the text, three that you probably caught. He says, your father is monitoring your giving your praying, and your fasting. Now, to be honest, all three of those could probably use their own sermon, and perhaps if we had time, we would spend an entire week on them individually or even collectively, Uh, but we're already 10 weeks into this series and halfway through the Sermon on the Mount, so I'm trying to make sure we don't end up in 2025 before we conclude this series, and thus I'm going to kind of skip the Sermon on the Three, and honestly, I don't really think that's Jesus' bigger point here. However, I will take just a moment and mention the obvious that we read in this text a moment ago. All three of those things are inconveniently preceded by the word when. Jesus says, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Not if, but when. In other words, these are not activities that you should consider potentially possibly implementing into your life as a follower of Jesus. These are not disciplines that are reserved for the spiritual elite. These are rhythms that should exist in the life of every single believer. All of us should be giving, all of us should be praying, and all of us should be fasting. This is normal kingdom people behavior. And the reason that Jesus states clearly that all of us should be doing these things is because each of them uniquely and individually display that we have fully surrendered our lives to the leadership and the lordship of Jesus. It is hard to say that you have given Jesus everything, that he is Lord of your life if you never give, you never pray, and you never fast. And I have a lot more I would love to say about that, but we do not have time this morning, so I'm just gonna throw that grenade in your lap, and I'm gonna let that one settle with you as it needs to. If they're not happening, you should probably get on with it and make sure that those things are taking place in your life. Sound good? Okay. Now, although Jesus mentions those three things specifically, I don't think he intended for us to apply them exclusively. I think he's speaking to a much broader reality in this text. In fact, I know he is because he doesn't just say that your father sees those things. He says your father sees everything that happens in your life. He is the all-seeing Arlo in the sky. 
He, he is the righteous ring cam of your life. He is looking at everything, whether it's your giving or your praying or your fasting or any other ing. God's watching our lives. He sees it all. And since I believe that is the greater truth that Jesus is attempting to convey here in this text, what I'd like to do in our remaining moments together is I would like to consider three secret things in our lives that God sees. Things that I think Jesus references here, perhaps a bit beneath the surface, but three that are supported throughout the teachings of scripture, and three that we all need to be aware of as we live this thing called the life of faith. So for the note takers, you're welcome. I gave you three points today. I know I haven't done one of those in a long time, but I've heard your cries, okay? I've read your strongly worded suggestions in the suggestion box. We don't actually have one of those. Uh, but, but here are your three points for the day. Number one, according to Jesus, it is clear that Jesus sees our secret successes. Our secret success. In, in all th uh, three of these, he makes it clear that your father is watching the good things that you do in secret. God sees your good deeds that are done in secret. Nobody else may see them, but God sees them. God sees when you resist temptation. God, God sees when you live with integrity while everybody else lives with compromise. God, God sees when, when you, you obey in obscurity. He, he sees your character. He sees your integrity. Nobody else might see. Your boss may not see, your spouse may not see, your kids may not see, even your brothers and sisters in Christ may not see, but God sees your secret success. In fact, he goes on to say that not only does God see it, he celebrates it. He says, your father who sees your good deeds in secret is waiting to reward you. I love that line. In fact, I want to take a couple moments and just kind of hone in on it a little bit because I think that line right there is one of the fundamental distinctions between our faith and dead religion. The fact that we have a good father that is waiting to reward us. So, see, dead religion says that God sees you too, that God is watching, but it says that God is watching you for a different reason. He's watching you because he's waiting for you to fail so that he can punish you for your sin. It's a picture of God with a club standing over your life. Just come on, mess up, slip, fail, do the thing again so that I can punish you for falling once again on your face in the spirit. And to borrow Jesus' phrase here, the word reward, it's like the only reward for dead religion is not falling into the hands of an angry God. And sadly, that is how so many people view the Father. Perhaps it's because of their own broken father relationship or, or, or because of dead religions, teachings, whatever. But there's a lot of people that just assume God is the angry guy in the sky waiting to punish them for their bad behavior. But Jesus tells us right here that nothing could be further from the truth. Your, your father is not waiting in heaven ready to take you out for disobedience. He's not waiting to punish you. No, he is eagerly standing by because he wants to reward you for doing what is right. And that word reward is a really, really cool word. Permission to geek out on the Greek for just a moment. Is that okay? Can we go there? Okay, three people. I'm going to do it whether you like it or not. That's fine. So... Normally, when you read through the scriptures and you see the word reward, it is the word mistos in the Greek. And the word mistos, it means exactly what you would think it means. It means an exchange of good for good. So you do good, you get good in return. That's, that's what, it's sort of karma, but karma is not Christian, so we can't say karma, so we call it something else. So, so it's, you get good for doing good. But interestingly, when Jesus says that your father is waiting to reward the good that you do in your life, he does not use this Greek word mistos. Instead, he uses a much weightier term in the Greek language, and the word is apodidomai, apodidomai, and it means to pay off or to discharge what is due as with a debt, tribute, or taxes. So, so wrap your head around this definition for a moment. It's like to pay off a debt that is due. So, so based on that definition, we could reword the phrase of Jesus here to say, your father who sees what you do in secret will pay you off 
for your good deeds. <laughs> it is this suggestion that when we do good things in secret, it's like we're putting God on the hook. Like we are triggering payment for a debt. And I apologize if that sounds heretical or dishonoring to God, but those are Jesus' words, not mine. Quite literally, what Jesus is saying is when you do good deeds in secret, that you place a demand on the blessing of God. How many would like a demanded blessing on your life from the Father today? Yeah, my hand is lifted. I think we would all want that. The only caveat to this blessing, this reward, Jesus says, is if the good deeds we do in secret don't stay in secret. If, if we want to publicize our good deeds, if we want others to know how righteous we are, then he says we let God off the hook. We forfeit the reward. The only reward we get for publicizing our good deeds is the temporary fleeting applause of humanity, which becomes addictive and then a cycle as we seek the approval of people, never getting it from our Heavenly Father. So, so little side, side note here. It's important to mention, especially since we've already studied previous verses in this Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus is not saying that nobody can ever know the good stuff you do, okay? That no one can know what the church is doing, no one can ever know what you're doing. No, he made it clear in some previous verses, let your light shine before men. Let your good deeds shine before men. The world should see that the church is doing some good stuff, okay? So he's not saying you gotta be cryptic and hidden and weird when someone asks you if you did anything, I don't know anything, I, I don't know what you're talking about. That's not what he's saying, okay? This is actually an issue of motive more than anything else. What he's saying here is that if you are doing good things so that other people will acknowledge you, if you're doing it for the praise and the accolades of men, but you're not living for an audience of one, then you have forfeit the reward that is yours in the Father. And honestly, I think this is a really, really important and really, really difficult thing to do in our current society, especially if you are under the age of 30 in the room because you grew up in a world that only knows how to publicize its secret successes. In the rise of social media and influencers, not only is there a peer pressure to celebrate everything you do on public platforms, but we have made it completely normal for nobody to do anything in secret. Our entire lives are broadcast out there. And sure, we don't blow trumpets when we give. That would be really weird, right? Someone in the hallway dropping a you know, check into the box. Look at me, that's, that's weird. And, and we probably don't stand on street corners and pray very, very, you know, old King James English prayers to impress people. But we sure do have our ways of publicizing the good things we do. Whether it is the, uh, the gym selfie, a.k.a. the swolfy. I think that's what they call it. I don't know. Or the perfectly curated photo of the Bible next to the scented candle and the coffee cup, hashtag blessed, spending time in the secret place with the Lord today. I love it when we fast at the beginning of the year and people post pictures of their plate of vegetables, you know, just suffering Daniel fasting for the Lord. I'm like, okay. <laughs> we, we, we live in a world where nothing is secret anymore. Nothing is sacred anymore. People don't know how to do good in secret. T to borrow the line from the comedian Jeff Foxworthy, even Victoria doesn't have secrets any longer in our world. But if that is a temptation for you, let me, let me give you a word of advice today. Uh, this is from Uncle Tim to you, okay? This is a mantra that I attempt to live my life by to the best of my ability because I do not want to forfeit the rewards that God has stored up for me, okay? If, if you need a phrase to help you in this process, here's my advice. Ready? Three words. Quietly crush it. Quietly crush it. You don't need everybody to know. Just crush it in secret. Hustle in secret. Read in secret. Pray in secret. 
Give in secret. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Solomon said in the Proverbs, let another man praise you. Maybe in our world, a better way to say that would be let another person repost you. You don't need to repost yourself. Let another man tweet you or X you or whatever the phrase is that we use now. You don't need to let everybody know. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. I will not boast in my strengths. If I'm going to let anybody know about anything, it's going to be my weaknesses. Because in my weakness, Christ is made strong. If we want the reward of God in our life, we need to get comfortable with crushing it in obscurity. Where nobody else knows. Listen, don't listen to the, to the ways of your world, the, the perverse nature of our culture. Be careful what you post. Be, be careful uh, when you chase after likes and, and reposts. and Be careful where you source your affirmation from. If that's what you're living for, that is all you're going to get. But if you get comfortable doing good in secret when nobody knows... Man, there is a reward stored up from you from a good heavenly father that is not waiting to punish you, but wants to give you good gifts for the good you do in secret. He says, your father sees all the good you do in secret. Now, while, <laughs> let's get those back there. Now, while that is a, a beautiful promise to cling to, I think it's a two-edged sword because it also serves as a bit of a warning to us. If God sees everything, including our secret successes, then it also stands to reason that number two, God also sees our secret sin. To borrow language from the previous point, others may not see it, but God sees it. Your boss may not see it. Your spouse may not see it. Your kids may not see it. Even brothers and sisters in Christ may not catch it, but God sees it. God sees financial impropriety. God sees compromise when nobody's looking. God sees the deleted text messages. God sees the wiped search histories. God sees the shredded paper trails. Even those things that we go to great lengths to hide from other people, God sees. I heard a pastor say one time, the scripture that tells us that God sticks closer than a brother is a great source of comfort in times of despair, but it's also a great warning in times of sin because when we mess up, God is standing right there by our side. <laughs> and you know, perhaps even just saying that gets you a little bit nervous or thinking about what did I post? What did I say? What did I do over the last couple of weeks? Maybe your palms are starting to get a little bit sweaty, knees weak, arms heavy, vomit on your sweater already, mom's spaghetti. I get it. But listen very clearly. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ today, then the reality of a God who sees your secret sin should never incite fear or condemnation. God does not condemn his children. He convicts his children, but he does not condemn his children. 1 John 4, 18 makes it clear. God's perfect love casts out all fear. Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. God does not condemn or use fear to motivate obedience, but he does convict. See, Condemnation is a weapon that the enemy uses to drive a wedge between you and God. Condemnation comes prepackaged with fear and shame and guilt. Makes us think that God wants nothing to do with us, so we stay at a distance. But conviction is the opposite. Conviction is like a magnet. Conviction draws us back to God because we understand that he is the source of my healing. He's the only one who can deal with my sin nature. In fact, Perhaps the best way for you to distinguish between what you're feeling, is this condemnation or is this conviction, is to simply ask, where am I running right now? If I'm running away from God because of my awareness of sin, then it is condemnation and is the enemy trying to keep me from my source of healing. 
But if an awareness of my sin causes me to draw near to God and repent, then it is him. It is the conviction of the Holy Spirit drawing me to a father who says, I love you too much to let you stay in your cycle of sin. So I'm bringing you close, not so that I can punish you, but so that I can forgive you and restore you. And I think, I think the evidence of that heart is proven in the words, once again, that Jesus uses in this text. When he speaks of those who live in secret sin, he does not call them sinners. It seems odd, but he calls them something else. In this text, as he talks about those who publicize their good deeds and live one way in the public and a different way in private, hoping nobody sees what's going on, he calls them hypocrites. Hypocrites. Now, I know that's an ugly word. Perhaps it even feels worse than sinner. <laughs> like, no one wants to be called a hypocrite. Like, ew, I don't want to call it that. But in the original Greek language, the word hypocrite is not a derogatory or offensive term. It's actually a theater term, believe it or not. In the original language, in the Greek, the word hypocrite simply means an actor who wears a mask. It's a word that would be used to describe someone standing on a stage, portraying a character to an audience, wearing a mask, pretending to be someone that they're not. Picture Phantom of the Opera, or if that's too lofty, then for the rest of us, Jim Carrey and the mask, okay? Then that's, that's the imagery here. The, the person isn't necessarily evil, they're just playing a part. And Jesus says that this is what secret sin is like. It's like playing a part. It's like standing on a stage before humanity, posturing and pretending to be something that you're not. And while the audience might be fooled and that might be caught up in the drama, there's a God who knows the man behind the mask. He knows the, the person who's trying to look one way in public, but is really struggling in private. But again, his heart is not to condemn that individual. How dare you act that way? You hypocrite. No, this is an appeal from the father. He understands how exhausting it is to continue to try to pretend to be something that you're not. By the way, everybody's pretending to be something that they're not. And beneath the surface, we are all broken Beneath the surface, we are all messed up and we are all sinners. None are righteous. No, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so to the mask-wearing individuals, God calls out, take off your mask. I know already. Your sin does not surprise me. I'm not shocked by your failures. When you confess, it's not for my sake. It's for your sake. I want to see the real you behind the mask. I want to meet with you face to face. Quit trying to comically hide like Adam and Eve did behind the trees and, and with the fig leaves thinking that I don't know where you're at. I know you. I know you're coming. I know you're going. I know the hairs on your head. I formed you in your mother's womb. Nothing happens off of my watch. So take off the mask so that I can love you and forgive you and restore you. Condemnation says shame on you. But conviction says shame off of you. Fear off of you. Mask off of you. And grace on you in Jesus' name. Yeah, he sees our secret sin. But it's because he wants to draw us back to himself that he points it out. So, God sees the secret successes. That makes me confident. God sees the secret sin that brings conviction. But there remains a third secret seeing here that I think is probably one of the greatest sources of comfort for every single one of us. A, a seeing that is not explicitly stated, but I believe indirectly implied through this text and a truth that we see all throughout the scriptures. In addition to the secret success and the secret sin, we're also told that our God sees secret suffering. Secret suffering. I think most of us, many of us, would probably be familiar with the story of Abraham, uh, the uh, father of the faith, 
the senior citizen that knocked up his wife in their 90s uh, and had a child 25 years after God promised it to him, a guy named Isaac. And it's a foundational story to our faith. If it's foreign to you, I encourage you to go back, read it, Genesis 12 through 22. It's a fascinating story, and it's really important one to understand, to, un- to unpack all the things we read in the New Testament. But a couple of months ago, we discussed in one of our services the kind of lesser spoken of, more forgotten part of Abraham's life. Maybe the embarrassing one that he doesn't like to talk about. The part where him and Sarah got a little antsy and were unwilling to wait for God to fulfill the promise and decided to take matters into their own hands. And at that time, uh, this story served as a great comfort as we entered into a chapter in our world history where the Middle East was once again experiencing and continues to experience such a a horrific war, Um, and it provided a bit of comfort on a worldwide level, but I think that God would use that same story today to provide some unique individual comfort to people in the room that might be suffering in this season. Uh, The story goes like this. Uh, Ten years after God makes this promise to Abraham and Sarah, uh, they have still been unable to conceive. And so Sarah attempts to to give Abraham a child, even though she is unable to carry that child, by offering up her servant Hagar. She says, have sex with my servant, and perhaps she will get pregnant, and therefore you will have a child. Now, I mentioned this last time, and I'll mention it again. Guys, if your wife ever says that, it's a bad idea. Just, just don't do it. Just practice with me. Ready? One, two, three. No. Okay? No. It's, that's the right answer. But Abraham did not give the right answer. Uh, he chose to follow through with this rather odd plan. And we pick up the story in Genesis 16. I'll invite the worship team to come as, as we read this and prepare to close. But it says, so Abraham said, Hagar. Hagar, never mind, okay. And had sexual relations with Hagar. <laughs> Take that out for the 11. Okay, good. And she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abraham, this is all your fault. (laughs) Typical. Uh, I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she's your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. And Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, you're now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Now look at this verse. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. You're the God who sees me. When a broken, distressed, abused woman ran away because of her mistreatment and was living in isolation thinking nobody saw her in her suffering God comes and he says I see you I know it feels like nobody sees you but I see you in your suffering you're not alone Hagar I I haven't left you in the wilderness to die in this season. I'm keenly aware of what you're facing. I am the God who sees. And from this moment forward, for the remainder of Scripture, we are told the story of a God who sees everybody suffering in secret. When the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years, suffering with slavery, God comes to Moses and he says, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen their suffering and I am coming down to rescue. When Hannah was suffering with infertility, the Lord came and he said, I have seen your suffering and this very year I will bring you a child. When a widow in Zarephath was suffering in the midst of a famine, God sent a prophet to tell her, I see your hunger, I see your suffering, and I know you're about to make this meal so you and your child can die, but I'm here to tell you that I see where you're at and I am bringing provision to your household. 
time and time and time and time again throughout the scriptures, we are reminded that we serve a God who sees those suffering in silence, suffering in the secret. But then as we get to the end of the scriptures, Hebrews 13 declares that that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning that his seeing did not cease with the scriptures. He is still the God that sees those that are suffering in secret. For every parent that is suffering, waiting for a child to return back to the father, God sees. God sees every child suffering at the hands of an abuser with no end in sight. He sees the lonely. He sees the poor. He sees the broken. He sees the downcast. He sees the disenfranchised and the marginalized. He sees you when no one else sees you suffering with depression. He sees you when you think to yourself, I can't take this anymore and I don't want to live on this planet. I just want it to be done with. He sees you when you cry and bottles up every tear because you long for companionship, but you go to bed alone night after night after night. He sees the sick and the hurting wince when that pain surges through their body, but they have to pretend to be strong for those around them. He sees it all. Not only does he see it, he sits with you in it. He is Emmanuel, God with you. God that will never leave you or forsake you. God that sticks closer than a brother. A God who understands your grief and your suffering because he is deeply acquainted with our deepest sorrows and our suffering. But not only does he see it and sit in it, but according to scripture, the God who sees it is also going to see you through it. He will not leave you there, but he will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. He will walk you to the other side. And I wish I had time to preach on this, but I'm two minutes over time. So instead, I'm gonna let the Apostle Paul do a, a sermon for us as we conclude. He preached it far better than I ever could. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter four. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be seen in us. But we continue to preach because we got the same faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself with you. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day for our present sufferings are small and they won't last very long yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever so we don't look at the troubles we can see now rather we fix our gaze on that which cannot be seen for the things we see now will soon be gone but the things we cannot see will last forever the God who sees you in it will see you through it so whether you're on a mountain or in a valley today, whether you're crushing it quietly, living with secret success, or you're failing behind the scenes, or in a season of suffering, you got a God that sees you, a God that loves you, a God that is waiting eagerly to reward you, and a God that will walk with you to the other side. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these words. Thank you for these truths that Jesus made clear to us. Thank you for your name, Emmanuel, the God that is with us, that is among us, that continues to prove time and time again that you will not forsake us. God, for anyone in this room today that is in a chapter of suffering, I pray they would see it as just that, the chapter. It's not the end of the story, but it is a part of the story. We mourn with those who mourn. We weep with those who weep. We sit with those who suffer. But God, we thank you that that's not where we stay. You are the God that says these light and momentary sufferings store up a treasure that far outweighs them all. Be the comforter, be near in these days. As we conclude this morning, maybe, um, that is a reality that you are not intimately familiar with. The God that is with you and 
Maybe the reason that is not a reality you've experienced is because you've been away from God. Maybe you've never made a decision to be his disciple and to follow him, or maybe you've spent some, some time away. Um, as we do every single week here, I wanna take a moment right now and just invite you to come back to Jesus, maybe to come to him for the first time. God's doing something as Robin shared earlier, a lot of people being saved in this season. And I know sometimes in this moment, it can feel like you're the only one lifting a hand or you're the only one making that decision. Man, the family of God is growing in here and there's a community of people that wanna walk with you. So if you're here today and and you're far from God and, and you know that he's calling you to give your life to him, to repent and come close, I'm gonna say a prayer of commitment with you in just a moment. Before we do that, could you just be bold, lift up a hand and look at me and say, that's me, Tim, I'm coming to Jesus today. I need to give my life to him. I got you in the back there, thank you. Yeah, I got you right there, cool. Yeah, right over here, awesome, right on. Cool. If I missed you, I'm sorry. Uh, let's, Let's pray together with these making this decision. Everyone say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I thank you for giving yours for mine. I choose to follow you, to be your disciple, to walk in your ways and be a part of your family. Help me to keep my eyes fixed on you from this day forward until I see you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Come on, celebrate with those making that decision today.